so they're going to have to handle the load for the, the three that had to leave. So. Pardon me? Dr. Wendt? Dr. Wendt? Dr. Wendt is on his way. I'm sure he's eager to come to the table. My name is Pastor Jerry Melius. I'm Pastor at Mount Zion Lutheran Church here in Denver. And I uh, was asked to just leave the panel discussion today with you all. Uh, I, I, in panel discussions that I've um, seen before, I think it's most optimal to have a panel size of about three, uh, maybe four. We have six, <laughs> which is challenging, and especially considering the subject matter. So I have a series of questions that a number of you have already submitted, and I'll try to, I'll try to ask as many of them as I possibly can. Uh, and then maybe if we have time or however it works out, we'll take some questions from the floor today. But I would ask the panelists, please, to be as brief as you can, and don't be offended if I start moving in on you or interrupt you or something like this to get to a different question. You're all my superiors, either in office or in intelligence, so it's intimidating. <laughs> <laughs> okay, uh, let's see. I don't particularly have an order, but perhaps, uh, Dr. Adams, you would like uh, to respond in some ways uh, to some of the things that were said about uh, completely St. Louis. Uh, Certainly. I'm, I'm, I'm happy to do that, uh, as long as you keep one thing in mind. Uh, I'm not an official spokesman for the seminary. I say that, uh, you know, most people forget that I spent five years in Washington, D.C. as the official representative of the Lutheran Church Missouri Senate there. And about the first thing I learned when I got to Washington is that in a position like that, you're not allowed to have private opinions. You know, if I say to the Washington Post, anything I say to the Washington Post that they choose to print the next day, which they did several times, um, was always prefaced by Dr. David Adams, you know, uh, of the Lutheran Church Missouri Center, or something like that. No, even even if it was a private, even if, was, even if I said we don't have an official position, my personal view is so and so. Uh, you know, I learned very quickly you just can't have personal views with your position like that. So uh, I'll try here to fair to represent what I think that an official representative of the institution would say uh, and uh, identify what's my personal opinion, if I say it. So with that in mind, um, I'll start off with a personal reflection. <laughs> when, I, when I personally read the, ar the article in question by Dr. Yerkin, my immediate reaction was, well, if that's what we're going to teach, I'm just going to resign because I don't think I can continue on the faculty here. Um, now, when it came up in our first meeting in the fall, uh, we spent quite a bit of time on that, and it became apparent that, you know, that reaction wasn't going to be necessary. Look, um, I think two things had to be said. First, we didn't do a very good job of editorial review. You know, um, everybody kind of trusts everybody, and uh, I mean, Dr. Jerkins not a member of our faculty, but he was well known to you know Chuck Aaron and some other people who were involved in it, and they had confidence in him. So uh, the editorial review process was not as rigorous as it ought to have been. Okay, because we, I, I think we, when we got news of that and we were kind of reading the article, I think some of us were wondering about the question, if that was an editorial review slip up, if it was an oversight, or if it was beginning to reflect actual yeah. uh, beliefs about some at the seminary. Well, I, I think in part, anybody who writes knows this truth, and most preachers and teachers know it too. That is, it's really difficult when you know what you think to write or say something 
in a way that's clear enough that someone else knows what you think. In other words, oftentimes, I know what I meant, and what I wrote on the page looks a certain way to me because I know what I was thinking. But you don't know what I was thinking, and so when you read it, there, you have it, it's unclear to you what I meant, even though I knew what I meant. So part of it, I think, was probably a failure on the author's side to clearly articulate what he was trying to say, and part was a failure on our side to do appropriate level of editorial review. Uh, I think those are two failures that, you know, in what happened that we, we could identify. Uh, Is there anybody else on the panel that would like to interact with Dr. Adams' statements? Sir? I do want to say one more thing before we leave this, but I'll, I'll let anybody else kind of jump in at that point if they want to say something. Please. Okay. The last thing I think I want to say, I'm trying to be brief, is that um, we didn't respond to the things that came to us from the districts as well as we intended to either. That's probably the third thing that needs to be said. And I think we made the same mistake that we kind of accused the district, or said the district people were making, and that was kind of rushing to judgment. You know, on, on matters. Uh, what the faculty wanted to say was, yes, there were mistakes made. We made them, you know, at least the ones that didn't involve authorship, the ones that involved editorial stuff we made. We sure wish that you had talked to us before adopting you know, a, a public statement. We realize it's public fault. But we wish you had clarified with us where we, you know, where we really stand before putting something out there for the world to see. That's what we really wanted to say. And you know, seminary professors, if you've been to the seminary, you know this. Seminary professors are justus peccator, <laughs> simple justus et peccator. That's we have all the same faults as everybody else in the world. Yeah. You know, uh, when people, when you feel like you're being attacked. Often the immediate, simple human response is to defend yourself. That's not, yeah, that's not, so <coughs> what, I, what I hear you saying is yeah. that, that, that it was more on the side of it, it sort of an oversight and kind of making it of editorial process. Yeah, yeah, I would like to comment just because I was um, involved behind the scenes on this. Um, I asked my guys in my district not to do anything publicly. Um, because I've been involved in a number of cases, and so I did it all privately. I had any number of emails uh, back and forth with Dr. Jerkin, and also uh, then phone calls, emails, back and forth with Professor Aaron, and I also met twice with Professor Aaron face-to-face um, -face for a number of hours um, to try and ferret this thing out kind of behind the scenes. Um, and I think there's a little bit more uh, from my conversation with Dr. Aaron that I think the main thing that I hit on is his intent on, on producing the journal and that is that he, he honestly wanted to provide an opportunity to sort of push the envelope and that was uh, something that I asked him not to do. I said you can do that in private conversation with the other professors but this journal is not the place to do that. I don't know if that ever made it through but that's kind of where we we, I mean, it was very, it was a very genial conversation, but point. Can I speak to that real quick? There's been, a, it's always been a debate for years now among the faculty about the role of the journal. And probably the majority view is that the journal should uh, provide a forum for discussion. Uh, sorry. Uh, that's not the view that I personally hold. Um, I think it, the reason that I don't hold it is not that I don't value open discussion, and I think there should be, needs to be room for it. But the problem is one of how it's perceived and what people understand. You know, uh, some, anything that goes out, the seminary's logo was on it, is going to be understood by the majority of readers as the position of the institution. Uh, and they have a right, I mean, it's a, you know, that's a normal, reasonable thing for them to conclude. 
And so using the journal as that kind of forum, I wouldn't say to push the envelope so much, that wouldn't be the language I would use, uh, as sort of as a forum for discussing things. I think it's a mistake, but I, I, don't, I don't get to make those decisions. Dr. Martin. Yeah, if I could comment, I think uh, the atmosphere in academia is uh, incredibly severe towards people who would hold our views. If, uh, you know, Dave and I went to the Society of Biblical Literature, which has a couple thousand people meeting, and had a young earth uh, sign, we would be excommunicated immediately and uh, be viewed as uh, Neanderthals. And one of the temptations, I think, for, and I'll comment on the university system, mainly, but also on our church's witness, is if you are uh, seduced by the academia uh, enterprise uh, and you want to be famous, you want to be seen as brilliant, it's a very challenging thing to take a public stance. And uh, that's where we have to resist uh, the uh, kind of dominating. I've heard of countless people wanting to get a PhD in the sciences, and if they're discovered to be a creationist, they are in deep trouble in most. The uh, University of Iowa had a recent case where a brilliant young scholar uh, said he actually believed in intelligent design, not in uh, young earth. Immediately, his tenure track was blocked. You know, so somehow the church needs to find areas where and places where uh, people could get terminal degrees that are credible and then speak out, you know, so that uh, I, I always used to enjoy it when my faculty spoke out. You know, I, they, they just, as a theologian, uh, and instead of talking about something esoteric, as Christian culture is melting down right now, why don't we talk about what it is to be a human being and the sanctity of marriage, the sanctity of life? And if a, a faculty is silent, on those things, in my judgment, they're not doing the church's bidding. Can I follow up on the question? This is actually a question we received, and that is this. Do the Concordia universities offer tenure? Do they have tenure? And do Concordia professors have their four, I would suppose, as a result, academic, quote, academic freedom? Uh, could you interact with that question? Sure. Uh, I'll take the last one first. Uh, we have all our professors sign a um, kind of uh, release of academic freedom. So they are signing off officially on a legal document that they will not teach against the teachings of the Lutheran Church Missouri Senate. And, and that's practiced by all our universities. Uh, in the tenure uh, case, most universities have gone to a three-year rollover contract or a five-year rollover. I think there are two exceptions to that. And I think uh, one of the beauties of tenure that uh, we, we kept tenure because when administrations come and go, if you happen to be out of sync with the new administration, you're vulnerable very quickly. If you have tenure, you're still vulnerable, but it will take a little more work and possibly a, a loss of public publicity. So I, I would vote that, you know, when a person has proved themselves, uh, particularly in uh, confessing the truth of the church and of Christ, that uh, the uh, institutions invest in that voice by giving them some protection. Uh, uh, as, uh, you know, bureaucrats come and go, yeah, it's a uh, uh, less than a, a secure position. Any other panelists have... Just so you know, uh, I don't know what... Sorry, for Wayne does, but in St. Louis we have the rolling contracts, you know, so we don't have tenure at the seminary in St. Louis. Well, Fort Wayne, as far as I know, still has tenure. Okay. Here, here, here's a, another question that we received, and maybe, um, I'll, I'll maybe uh, just throw this out to, to any of you that would like to um, answer. And it's good, but I'm trying to group some questions together here. But a question that we got here uh, we've heard about teachers in our synod. Uh, Dr. Heck, I think probably your, yours was mostly elucidating here, uh, but, but others too, who do not hold to our position on creation and other matters. Uh, why are these false teachers not removed from the synod? And I said maybe any of you would like to feel that one because uh, 
um, there's nobody here actually who, who, who has the authority to remove somebody from the Senate, but uh, perhaps your opinion on, on something like that. Uh, maybe President Forky you field this one, or maybe Dr. Beck. Yeah, I was going to say Terry Forky should address it. He probably has more practical experience in this matter than any of the rest of us. I could address it. I think the key thing is what is the administrator, especially the provost or chief academic officer and the president, what's, what page are they on? They, they first of all need to know where this is being taught and sometimes that information doesn't get to them. And then when they find out that, say, biologist A has advocated for Darwinian evolution, then that faculty member needs to be called in and um, basically told with gentleness and respect, of course, with the 315, that um, you have two choices in the matter. Either you cease to make statements of that sort that are supportive of learning evolution, or we're going to have to part ways. I, I can add that uh, when the situation arose at uh, uh, Nebraska, I called Brian Friedrichs, the president, and asked him to uh, address that situation. He did, and I think the results were uh, somewhat, uh, you know, um, a result of his careful interaction. Uh, and more recently, I learned that uh, we have to be careful, uh, you know, in terms of not uh, intervening prematurely. But if two or three or four people uh, from a campus, when we were reviewing a campus for three days, and if that comes out that a, a professor is teaching this and advocating for it, not as a theory, but advocating for it, uh, there's a problem. And uh, in this case, uh, more recently, I talked to the president and he assured me that he would handle it, uh, that uh, the professor will not do that uh, publicly. Okay, so ecclesiastical supervision is the broad term used in the Lutheran Church of Missouri Synod for those who are given the responsibility to judge the doctrine and the life of members of the Synod, that is rostered, uh, rostered members and congregations. So the synodical president and the district presidents are given the responsibility of ecclesiastical supervision. So there's two points I think that you would probably be beneficial for you to understand with regard to answer that question. Uh, from an institutional standpoint, it is very, very, very difficult to remove someone from the roster for false teaching. It shouldn't be that way. It's my, it's my particular analysis. It shouldn't be that way, but it is. So I'll give you a case in point. Um, oh, let me back up. I have to be very careful because I don't want you to draw conclusions about individuals in cases, but... Um, so Matthew Becker was on the roster with the Church of Missouri Synod and was publicly advocating for evolution as a fact for years and years and years, many years, and nothing was being done. Um, I was not his ecclesiastical supervisor, but I was a member of the Lutheran Church of Missouri Synod, and it was abhorrent to me. It was very, very difficult. Um, but I took on that case personally two and a half years. Two and a half years it took. Um, countless conversations, phone, emails, and then a couple face-to-face -face before we finally reached a resolution in that case. It's very difficult. 120 pages I wrote, 120 pages on that case, in order to make sure that it, it would hold. So, one point. Our, institutionally, we have written bylaws that make it very difficult. You can decide whether that's too difficult or not. Obviously, we want to protect the individuals. Secondly, the second part of it is, and here again, please do not draw conclusions about any individuals, but there's a great deal of pressure on ecclesiastical supervisors not to take up these cases. Because it's our livelihood. We are elected to this position. And if we start being mean to people, which is how the world generally judges that sort of activity, you can no longer be a member of the Lutheran Church of Missouri Synod. That's a mean thing to do. It takes away their livelihood. Um, it doesn't bode well for many people. So those are a couple of things that I think 
people who are in the queue need to think about um, from an institutional and from a personal standpoint. Okay. A quick comment. You know, things that were said by both of you remind me of an important point that this is ultimately a leadership issue, isn't it? And I don't mean necessarily synodical leadership. I'm, I'm thinking of institutional leadership. The, you know, the senior administrators of most institutions have a natural instinct to protect the institution. Right? That's part of that's part of the way they think. That's part of being in that office. But that's not something the church can ultimately afford. Uh, we need to have as presidents of institutions, and again, I'm not thinking of the Senate so much as our educational institutions, we need to have people who are not only theologically orthodox, but who are also theologically trained to have an appropriate level of judgment, and who have the personal integrity and boldness to do what needs to be done for the sake of the church. And, and too often, we have elected people or promoted people to senior administrative positions based on, you know, the fact that they have a degree in, you know, higher education administration or something like that. And this is not a blanket condemnation of those people, but there's more to being a president of a of one of our institutions than there is to just be president of an institution, and we, our first instinct has to be to make sure we get the right people, the right kind of people, in those kinds of offices. This is, a, I have another question for you. Just, I, actually, yeah, for all the panelists, or whoever would like to respond, for your advice, I'd ask. And I'd ask this on, on behalf of, of our society here, the Denver Society of Creation. Um, Dr. Wente, you mentioned there, which I appreciated your kind remarks in response to Pastor Shear, who pointed out a bunch of elephants in the room and probably dragged some elephants into the room and then left. <laughs> <laughs> I appreciated your kind response to him. You said in your comments that it, it, that uh, Pastor Harrison is dealing with these things in various ways. Uh, it, I think you probably urged some degree of patience, that sort of thing. At the same time, we, of course, want to be involved. And the Denver Society of Creation wants to encourage the Lord's Church in helpful ways to address these problems. What advice would you offer us as a society in particular, or just maybe just as Lutheran uh, uh, parish pastors or lay people, to, mm, to encourage greater fidelity? Or maybe you could just say, to be a squeaky wheel. To, that this would be getting attention because I think a lot of people in this room want to be a squeaky wheel and want to encourage in a helpful and godly way. I, not, not, I, I, I'm tagging on your comment, but I'm opening this up to all the panelists. Um, perhaps Mr. Riddle, uh, you, you would have something to offer here or any, or, or any of you. How could we be helpful? Yeah. Listening to what's going on so far, <laughs> I'd be real scared to be part of the Lutheran group here. <laughs> to tell you the truth. It sounds like we have a lot of politics. We've let that in there. And you hit a key issue there. Leadership. Where's our leadership? Yeah, you, what I hear is you can have somebody there teaching abortion and it's going to take two years to get rid of them. You can have somebody there teaching Jesus Christ is not God and it would take two years to get rid of them. We've got a problem. In other words, are we going to hold the doctrine or are we not going to hold the doctrine? It's not a hard issue. You've set up so much policy. You do need to protect your professors against false accusation. But if they're not teaching according to the doctrine you have set up, they're teaching false doctrine. You've got a clean house. And you just set something up to do that. I would be real afraid, honestly, to be a Lutheran in this kind of situation, from what I've heard here. I would not send my children to a Lutheran school. There's a great danger, and this goes for many. I, I make very blanket. It. it can be dangerous to send your children to almost any Christian school today. Because you better find out what they're really teaching there. Mm -hmm. Because it's not just a Lutheran problem, it's across the board. That we've allowed our universities to take it over. You know, that's a wonderful strategy. It started, I know, in 1905. 
with a group of about 100 people got together to rid America of Christianity. The reason they had to do that, so we could become a socialist nation. And what are the churches in all this? For over a century now, the churches have remained dormant. We haven't done our job. We're acting too much like the world. We let the world in. We don't screen our professors. We need to have a piece of paper. They need to sign. If this gets violated, then you can be put on probation or terminated. Amen. We need to keep a clean house here and protect our students. That's right. I want to help you think a little more positively about the Lutherans. <laughs> I, uh, I, I think, and you know, this is just my opinion, but I think if uh, we identify the professor who uh, was teaching pro-abortion, uh, they would be gone swiftly. I think the mechanisms are available, and I think the uh, leadership of the Senate would act. Or if they're teaching, uh, you know, against the deity of Jesus, uh, their uh, career, I think, uh, would be uh, a very short one. Now that isn't to, to minimize the need to be clear. And I think, by God's grace, our church is becoming clearer and clearer that certain things will not be tolerated. And that uh, authority comes not from me, but from the president of our Senate and the, the Council of Presidents. And uh, maybe, you know, President Forkey can say my uh, view of the distance is that there, the movement is towards a greater care and attention to detail on some of these key doctrinal issues. I would love to see a process much like what happens with Michigan District and South Wisconsin, where Concordia, Wisconsin, Concordia, Ann Arbor, the interview process where new faculty are hired, all of them go through the, the kind of questioning that happens there. Apparently it happens in Irvine, too. Just a little closer here. That were um, true across the Senate, where every district president was involved in that, those particular ways, it would stop many of the problems from coming in the front door. It would be a long-term solution and not the exclusive way to solve the problem. I would encourage you to, uh, your society to think uh, along three lines. Um, first, uh, be personal. That is. In the cases where you're working with an individual, go talk to the individual. Because lots of times what you see or hear out there is not the truth. And you really need to deal with the individual person face to face. I mean, you just need to. Second, um, I would say in your public pronouncements, I would really encourage you not to be militaristic. I know we have honored Christian soldiers in our hymnal. But in the world that we live in, that that sort of take no prisoners attitude is not beneficial to how you're going to be seen by the rest of the world. So speak kindly, speak gently. And thirdly, be persistent. Don't give up. Keep submitting the same overture over and over again. I've been a pastor for 36 years. Every synodical convention, my congregation has submitted an overture regarding evolution. So I don't know how many that is. Uh, most of them never made it to the floor. Don't give up. <clears throat> Keep saying the same thing over and over and over. Can I yes. ask? Yes. Uh, you asked what you could do. Just, uh, I'll say this, and I think I am reflecting the way that St. Louis Seminary faculty thinks. We want to be held accountable by the church. We recognize that we're accountable to the church. And we want the church to hold us accountable. So we're not afraid of that. Uh, and so, you know, my, I guess my word of advice or encouragement would be, be like the Berean Christians, you know, who tested what Paul said by reading the scriptures. So do that with us. I, I, I concur, you know, if you think you perceive a problem, then deal with it in a godly way. You know, uh, you know speak to somebody, make sure you, you're, make sure you're reflecting what they teach accurately before you condemn them for it. Uh, but be aggressive, I'll use the word aggressive, be aggressive, be, that'd be a better word, be enthusiastic, be anxious for the truth. 
and don't hesitate to, you know, if you don't hesitate to ask questions uh, and try to find out what is being taught and to test it against God's Word. Because all of those of us who serve the Senate in any professional capacity, he quotes, we have an obligation to the church. And um, we, I know I'm speaking for our faculty when I say that, I'm sure I for Fort Wayne, and for the theological faculties at the college. We all take that obligation seriously. And we want to do it right. Maybe we don't always do it right, but we always want to do it right. Thank you. I, got, I got a kind of a, uh, a, a, a little bit of a mean question. But uh, Dr. Wente, you um, mentioned that our teachers are, do, are doing their work most of the time at great sacrifice, fi uh, in other ways, but financially. Just for, I want to just go from one panelist to the next. From the hip, how much do you think an average professor is sacrificing to teach at one of our Concordias, or at perhaps at the seminary, uh, uh, as compared to where they could comparably teach elsewhere? No. Which side? Which what side wants to start? I'll go first since I taught it. Both. I told you that. Yeah, uh, people who teach at the college level sacrifice a lot more than those of us who teach at the seminary level. Well, uh, I don't get paid what by you know, people in get parallel paid. positions in other you know uh, institutions get paid. I get paid a lot better than my colleagues at the Sonoma College level. I used to teach at Concordia Ann Arbor. And frankly, uh, it's shameful what I got paid at that time. Uh, and I used to joke that the reason was that college professors get paid on the synodical teacher salary scale, whereas seminary professors get paid on the, the pastoral uh, you know, uh, salary scale, which is a little better. It's, you know, it's not great, but it's, it's better. So take a leap. What do you, what do you think it is? What, what, I told you, from the hip. What, 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 I mean, what do you think they sacrifice? I'm just, I'm, I'm personally curious. Oh, you mean the dollars? Yeah. Half? Okay. okay. I, don't, I don't know if you guys have to Half is what, you know, half of what they could make in, you know, in other institutions. Others? I told you. 20 to 40,000. They wouldn't hire me to teach theology. <laughs> <laughs> If I were in a discipline that they actually had, and, and I was serving as well as I am in my discipline, yeah, I, I would probably double my salary. Then. I would think double the salary. Not a no clue. No clue. <laughs> All right. Um, I might. I, I'm kind of. I'm, I feel like I'd like to open up. Is there anybody that's got a burning question? Now, I'm not taking comments, so quick questions, perhaps. Anybody? Uh, real quick, can I go yes. one more comment? Are you sure? Is it our... if one, one second. Is there anybody that would like to follow up on the question? And then, Dr. Adams, you go ahead. Well, I was just going to say, I was reminded that uh, in the Ann Arbor Evening News, they used to publish about once a year a map uh, that showed the like poverty areas of the city, you know, income and poverty areas. And it was always a standing joke among the faculty that the faculty housing area uh, was marked as one of the, you know, as one of the most intense areas of poverty in, in our area. So I don't know what that adds up to in dollars, but, it, but that's, that's the truth. Uh, question for any of the panelists, I guess. Uh, what is being done to recruit church workers to our Concordias to be able to be rostered teachers or pastors? There's a, a major effort being led by Dr. James Bonnet, the former president of the Northern uh, North Dakota District. And uh, I'm not sure if it will be rolled out at the convention or shortly thereafter, but there uh, is a foundation that has given hundreds of thousands of dollars for that effort. And I think it's uh, wonderfully orchestrated because he's emphasizing quality. Uh, and that's uh, really uh, significant. I think that it's not like if you couldn't pass math or computer engineering that you need to try theology. You know? uh, we want to 
cut away that attitude. Um, and uh, I really think that, you know, if I could uh, go back to the financial piece, sure. this might interest you. I was a, a humble assistant professor when I took a call to a parish in Iowa West. And as a professor, uh, our Christmas bonus was a case of grapefruit. Uh, then I got the Christmas, first Christmas came around in Atlantic, Iowa. I, well, it was just overwhelming, the, the amount of gifts, including cash. And the salary was about uh, 15 grand more, plus a car allowance. I mean, this was uh, really, I was, uh, you know, uh, like a millionaire. And, uh, I, and then I had two calls while I was in Atlantic Iowa to the St. Louis Seminary, and I declined both of them because I was having such a good time. So I feel really good. We got turkeys this year. We got hams this year, which is the first time we've ever got any hams. And that was because we had a donor who actually donated the money for them. Praise the Lord. The question for the uh, we're we being done from Grapefruit, I want you to know. What, what is being done to recruit church, church workers? Uh, well, I just want to comment on that. Uh, not, um, well, I suppose it is somewhat pro programmatic. I, hopefully you're all aware that um, we are in dire need of church workers. Are you all aware of that? That the number of men at this seminary is way down. Uh, I think we placed um, about 98 guys, something like that, this year from the seminaries, and church worker, uh, excuse me, teachers, particularly principals, uh, are, are really in dire need in our schools. So we discussed this at the COP meeting last spring, so not at uh, spring of 2018, and during the conversation, um, I just happened to comment. I said, you know, our Lord tells us to pray to Him that He would send workers into the harvest field. I said, wouldn't it be nice um, if we had an official program where we were all together praying that God would send workers into the harvest field. And I suggested that we do that through this Let Us Pray, which is written prayers that all pastors have access to on the Synodical website. And I know a lot of pastors use that. Um, and if, if you haven't noticed it, whoever was listening on that day actually did it. So that in every week in Let Us Pray, there is a prayer about sending workers into the harvest field for the last year. I don't know how long it's going to go on, but it is programmatic, but it is also biblical. And I'm just going to lay that on you, to your brothers and sisters. The church is in dire need of men and women who will serve full-time in the church, whether pastors, teachers, whatever. Um, please pray that the Lord of the harvest would send that, because he's the one who's going to do it. I, I guess just to follow up to what do you feel maybe is the major impediment to people doing that? Why, why are students, in your opinion, not moving to church work? I think uh, yeah, a huge factor is the surrounding culture and the devaluating of the church, whether it's our church or other churches, uh, the horrible situation that the Roman Catholic Church has experienced, and then the media, uh, and I think many parents are presently thinking, you know, why would I encourage my son or daughter to go into church work? And we need to reverse that, in my view, with an aggressive kind of uh, faithfulness. And uh, I'll just use this as an analogy, but in the Catholic Church, the seminaries and colleges that are most conservative are attracting the most young people. And uh, my neighbors are devout Catholics who run a Harley Davidson dealership. They said, we've got a wonderful priest, uh, and seven people uh, from our parish are studying to be priests. We need pastors who have such quality that young men are, and so they invited me over for dinner. This priest, he was articulate, he was disciplined, he knew his stuff, I mean, he was really rigorous, and he's heroic in serving his parish. Those people don't get much attention in the press, but in his case, for example, seven young men are looking at the Catholic priesthood, and if we can elevate our really outstanding pastors into a recruitment role, we'll get the best uh, people. Dr. Helmkamp, do you have anything to add? I'm not forcing you to. I'm just <laughs> 
<laughs> um, do I have the, the few minutes it would take to, to share? Yes, please. Okay. So the, the, the last slide on my talk that I didn't get to was to relay an incident uh, associated with my completing the colloquy in Texas uh, a few years back. And it, it, a, an example of how materialism has gained access to our, our colleges as well as maybe through the textbooks. So I needed to defend my, um, my statement of faith as the final exam for the colloquy. And you choose a university. I was in Texas, so I chose Austin. And uh, I went there, you know, having to study up. <laughs> I don't, was not raised Lutheran, so I was expecting to uh, explain you know, my understanding of the sacraments and the distinctives of, of Lutheran theology. Well, I got there and uh, got lunch in the cafeteria and found myself engaged in an impromptu evolution creation debate with a, a gentleman who seemed like he must be faculty, but I didn't know. I didn't know anybody up there. I was, it was 1 o'clock that I would have my, uh, my thing, but it was, so I was grabbing a bite to eat, and it was really kind of interesting. <laughs> so it got me a little bit upset, perhaps, but I tried to forget it and go into my, my exam. And, and I don't know whether my reputation preceded me in some way, because I've been quite active in creation apologetics in the Houston area at some different churches. I don't know if that had anything to do with it, or just the debate in the lunchroom got over, but my, my college defense turned into a um, creation evolution debate also. Uh, I was never asked about distinctions of Lutheran theology. It was um, kind of, I don't even remember details of it. I, was, I think I was in shock. I was naive, I think, so excited to be in a church that embraced officially, or if we don't use that term, the, the uh, young of creation position. So I, I, I left. <laughs> I went home. I was passed. I, <laughs> I learned later, talking about the heck, that it was actually some question whether I would be passed um, with my colloquy. And I, I think my... Not if I had anything to say about it. <laughs> but, um, I, I also, at that point, I felt like I had no choice but to call the president of uh, the university to tell him, because I also learned in the meantime that the person I had this conversation with was, was the dean of arts and sciences. So, the, with the impromptu creation evolution debate. And I, I can't even say it was a theistic evolution, it was just evolution. And uh, so I, I called the president of the university, spoke to him, and Convey. I think he thought I was going to complain about how I was treated as a woman or something. I, that's that was the least thing on my mind. It's never been an issue. Uh, so I, I, I shared that. And interestingly, at the, I had been recommended by um, Concordia University system, my mentor at the time, to this president for a position. And I had been told verbally, we'll find a place for you. And uh, mm. that was the same president I spoke with. I, I never heard back. Mm. Um, but I did come and have the one marvelous opportunity of talking creation uh, science in Dr. Heck's Old Testament class. And it was a wonderful privilege. That was really neat. So thank you. <laughs> but I only share this. To, to, I don't know, the, the names even involved anymore, but I, I share it that uh, we, we, there are some real concerns to ponder <laughs> in this arena, <laughs> or it were, anyway. Thank you, Dr. Helkin. Did, Dr. Heck, you suggested in the Society of Creation uh, that you and uh, Pastor Locklear, the professor, did, uh, that, that you believe that you would have more members, but you think a number of the professors have some degree of fear of associating with a group like that. Can you tell me, perhaps, on what basis uh, you you might suggest that? There have to be if fifty-eight percent of our Lutheran high school teachers are young creationists, and if uh, we as a denomination have passed resolution after resolution condemning Darwinian evolution at the semantic level. And uh, we have seminaries that are training young men to be pastors. They're faithful to 
the scriptures, the LCMS position on creation. Uh, the overwhelming majority of our pastors have to be young earth creationists, and a lot of them are theolo get called to theology positions at the Concordias. Uh, a lot of our uh, teachers come out of schools, and Lutheran schools, and end up at these universities. So just given the demographics of where we are as a denomination, there have to be dozens more, maybe a couple hundred more, that really do support the position of the LCMS. I was hoping that we'd get to the point where we had so many um, members of the faculty who are part of the society that it would be an easy thing to do, and we haven't uh, gotten over that hump yet. So have you, have you had then, just to follow up, have you actually had people that have told you, I'd like to be in your society, uh, just not, I'm going to decline for professional reasons or something like that? I've asked a number of people on my own campus and they just haven't responded. And the, the request falls on deaf ears, I'll have to think about it, and then they never do. President Forky, please. I want to go back to the question about why we're having difficulty. I think there are three things you should, folks should think about, pray about. <coughs> One, um, to Dr. Helmkamp's uh, point about raising our children, is that the current generation, uh, whatever they call them, what are they called, Gen X's, whatever would be, Gen Z's, um, obviously not all of them, but they are characterized by a severe personal bent. They think about themselves. And I noticed that my young men that are just coming out of the seminary, it's very difficult. It's all about them. Some say, I work 30 hours, and when I'm done with 30 hours, that's it. I go home. That kind of a thing. The, the office of the word doesn't bear very well with that kind of an attitude. Second, um, money. What's the average indebtedness of a guy coming out of the seminary? 80,000? No, it used to be 30,000. I don't know. I've been gone for seven years. Okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to suggest it's somewhere around $80,000. That's what, that's what I'm seeing. Yeah, do well. I mean, uh, to be clear, I think most of that is probably incurred before they get to us at both institutions. Understood. Nevertheless, yeah, no, it's, it doesn't make it the field. You still owe the money. But you still owe the money. Well, however, the debt came, they come into the field. With, I've got a guy with $120,000 personal debt. He comes into Montana, he makes $36,000. That's just crazy, right? And the fourth thing is the fear of going to jail. The third thing is the fear of going to jail. I mean, it's just right out there. My guys say to me, well, will you come visit me to jail? And I said, well, I will probably be there before you do. I'm going out front. But that, that's the state of things right now. Whether pastors or teachers, same thing. So those three things, please think um, pray about that. Mr. Finnessy has a question. This is probably a few, uh, Dr. Adams. When uh, we were in Santa Barbara last summer on a uh, Genesis uh, Creation Institute, from one of your one of the workshops out of St. Louis. At the very beginning of the conference, there were oh, three or four pastors that were concerned about how do you deal with people in your congregation with regards to science or apologetics. You spoke earlier today about the amount of hours that we have for each of the seminarians. That's a tough schedule for them. And I can understand how apologetics and how do you work with science, proving the Bible or confirming the Bible, how do you do that? May I make a suggestion that you could possibly take back, and I'd like to have you comment on it too. If the hours are that tough to fill in, you know, and there's nothing extra you can do, could you have once a semester on a Saturday an eight-hour class for some of your seminarians or pastors coming back that would be interested in on a top, the topic of how does science confirm the Bible or on the apologetic side, how they can work with some of their congregation members that are really struggling with their faith. Uh, I'd like to hear your comment and bring that message back if there's something, oh, another one, even online teaching on, on those two subjects. That would, that would be good too. Uh, briefly, please. Yeah, uh, well, uh, the short answer is yes. I think we can do a lot of things. 
uh, like that and, and other things as well. One of the problems that we face, and I'm not sure if this applies to Fortnite as well, I'm not sure we really have anybody on our faculty who is competent to address those, those issues of the creation science with an emphasis on the science side. You know, we're all theologians. None of us are scientists. So I, we need to find, for example, somebody locally in St. Louis that we could work with to te teach something. The, you know where they could bring, they would be able to bring in some of the, you know, if you will, the science stuff. Uh, because I can't speak credibly to those issues. I don't know that stuff. Uh, so uh, that's a, you know, that's that's a challenge. And I don't know what the situation is in Fort Wayne, uh, but one of the reasons we probably don't have, for example, an elective. Part of that this is because we wouldn't like to have it, like to talk on that. We just don't have anybody who could do it. Okay. Uh, there's a gentleman right next to you that could probably address that. It won't, he's not necessarily Lutheran. And many of the people that are in the apologist side and the science side, they could help. You'd have to go out of the Lutheran church, but it might be a way to get things moving forward along that lines of science and apologetics. Our students would thank me for putting in this situation where they had to do push-ups. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I, I might add that uh, we have two professors at, at Fort Wayne, they're still there, that are pretty competent in uh, particularly the philosophical areas. And then our uh, university in Irvine has really specialized in apologetics under uh, Mansky and uh, a few of the other uh, older professors. They, they are, there are three younger professors uh, at uh, Irvine that are deeply involved in apologetics. I had a question. Um, it really concerns me that it took two and a half years of constant work and hours and hours of work to address error in a uh, Lutheran school. What do you think about all the students in those two and a half years that were being taught? Let's talk about the students. 20 plus years. You know, I agree. That's, that's a long time. And uh, I think one of the uh, hopeful things is if uh, a president is in the right position and if he has the support of his board, he can act more quickly. If a president's heart isn't aligned with the confession uh, uh, thoroughly, uh, that can delay the process, and, and that's a really important position. I remember the uh, surprising feeling of actually having power when I went from being a faculty member to a president. And I noticed in the first months that uh, a lot of our people were sinning because the previous administration had put up some speed bumps at the seminary that were about that high. Uh, and the students and faculty were both using bad language. So uh, I, I just by fiat said, take those things down. And wonderful peace and tranquility. Uh, <laughs> but on, on a darker note, uh, when in 15 years there were problems, and I agree with President Ford, you, you have to talk to the person, you have to uh, plead for clarity, but when it's clear that there's false doctrine or moral behavior, uh, Tragically, a, a person can be removed. And even though they can be forgiven, uh, my view was that uh, that does not mean you can continue in the office uh, because your behavior or your teaching uh, precluded that. So I, I'm hopeful that we can, you know, reduce that two and a half years while maintaining a charitable 
spirit. Well, I, I, I think that maybe some panelists like to offer additional comments, but I'd ask you to make a brief. We've been on this subject for a while, and I think we'll, we'll probably move on. So, Dr. Adams. Real quick, uh, just to clarify, the case that President Wilkie was talking about, Terry Trent, if I'm wrong about this, but that person was not at one of our colleges. He was on our clergy roster, but he was not teaching at one of our schools. So we didn't have as much direct administrative control over that situation. President Forky. He was rostered, uh, rostered LCMS. Apparently we're in Oh, there we are. Rostered LCMS pastor teaching at, oh, not in the institution, but not one of our concordance. Nonetheless, very public, uh, very well-known voice as an LCMS. Okay, a little uh, personal story. Uh, our son, oldest son, came home from high school as a sophomore one day and told my wife, um, I think I want to be a pastor. And he's just finishing up his 23rd year now. And he had good educational background, we think, and support from the church and so forth. But the reason for the society is to get our children educated and in the right mind. We're talking about high-level education here. We need to talk on the so-called lower level of education, which is the purpose of the society, to get that uh, into their minds. I'd like uh, Mike to respond to that. You know, what's the importance of talking at the university level and so forth if we don't have them convinced when they're in high school that they want to go in church work. That seems to me where we're not getting our church workers is in the grade school, middle school, high school level before, before they get to college. And I'd like uh, Mike to respond to that. The uh, studies show that the first you formulate their ideas and opinions very early in life. Uh, one of the things I do when I train teachers, I confront teachers who have been teaching for 20 years and train them on teaching. But one of the things I like to start a class off with is this. Those Christian teachers don't understand the value of their job. I know they don't get paid the bucks for it. That's, that's number one. And that needs to change as best we can. But they have one of the most important jobs in the world. It far supersedes a computer teacher and anything else there. Because they're not there just to teach knowledge. They're there to change it's the eternal matters they're talking about. And we need to get good teachers at our lower grades and make sure they do get the pay. I just got done doing a fundraiser for a small Christian school in Tennessee. That's all I was invited in, to do a 45-minute talk. Not once did I talk about money. But when I finished, Everybody in there was willing to give lots of money. I have to think, all I do is say, here's the alternative. You send your children to public school, what are they going to get and what are they not going to get? We need to value our teachers a lot more and honor that profession from kindergarten all the way up. I showed that chart uh, yesterday. We're losing a lot of our children at the junior high level. What are we going to do about it? That's the question. Are we going to value those teachers, make sure they're well trained, See, most of the teachers we have today, and it's not just Lutheran folks, this is across the board, aren't qualified to teach this subject. They're not qualified to teach apologetics or creation. It can be taken care of. We just need to decide whether we want to do it or not. There are people out there that can train the teachers. It doesn't take a college degree to be trained in this subject. It can be done in a matter of a month, several weeks. You get a teacher up to speed to be able to teach this in their classes. We can do it within the church. We can add <coughs> courses in the church and do it that way and get teachers well trained so they can own the subject matter. It doesn't take another four years in college. It doesn't take another year in college. There's people out there that can do this training and they can do it at a very good cost because what's at stake, folks, is this next generation. We need to understand who are our customer here. It's our youth. We need not play politics with that. We need to get right to the issue. Mr. Rue, I'm going to hold that mic. I got a 
question for you, and I'll extend it to anybody else who wants to ask. But I have two questions that are similar. One is, uh, what is creation science? Uh, define it. Uh, uh, David Meyer used this term without definition. And then the uh, second question is, what's the difference between cre creation science and theistic evolution? And maybe quickly you could. Okay, creation science, I, I generally don't use the term. There's biblical creation, and there's good science. And the two go together. We get into this idea of creation science. Yes, what it means is we have the scientific evidence, not that it confirms the Bible. We don't need science to confirm the Bible. That means science is higher than the Bible. We have science out there that agrees with God's word because it's all together. Right. So I don't. I, it's a, nothing wrong with using the term. But what it means is yes, we have a we have we believe the biblical model of creation, and the scientific evidence is there. Now, difference between theistic evolution and creation. Now I've got a brand new book out called Theistic Evolution. Brand new book. I looked at the authors. Every one of them is a theistic evolution. Didn't they? they destroyed theistic evolution. But you know how they did it? They used their own definition of theistic evolution. That's how they did it. In that book, they're, they're, they use what I call weasel words. They just There's great stuff in there against evolution. They really go against evolution. But then they say, oh, the age issue is not important. Several places there say, folks, the holy grail of evolution is billions of years. It does not come out of the Bible. Right. So billions of years is a part of the evolution model, not the Bible. Right. So if you believe in billions of years, you have a theistic evolution model. That's it. That's how I put the word. So we've got to be very careful of how they define terms to get their worldview into the churches. And we've allowed that because billions of years, what's the issue? So that's, we've got to be very careful of sneak attacks. Thank you. Dr. Adams, here's a question for you. Uh, you stated that no one on the Concordia Seminary, uh, I think there's some faculty, thinks that a day in Genesis 1 is other than a 24-hour day, although I think you said a natural day. Would you say that no one on the faculty thinks that the Earth is billions of years old? Yes, I would say that. Uh, I, I think uh, maybe uh, Joel, it was you who had the comment from, <coughs> uh, from uh, primarily Charles, or maybe it was some of the things that we co-wrote. But uh, I, I think there's a unanimous view that the age of the earth would be measured at thousands of years rather than billions or billions. I don't know that we would all, in fact I can say with certainty, we wouldn't all agree that the age of the earth is six is about 6,000 years. I, I, I'm, I'm quite happy to say my own view would probably be that it wouldn't be more than 15,000. But somewhere between there, I, you know, I, I don't know that I can could say, and this has to do with the interpretation of the genealogies of Genesis 5 and 10, not with the interpretation of Genesis 1 to 3. Uh, but, uh, you know, that's a subject for another discussion. But uh, I don't think that the uh, a, a, an age of anything more than, much more than that, would be held by anybody on our faculty. I feel very confident in saying that. Here's another question for you. Does the language of, quote, natural day that you use yeah. allow for ambiguity that the day could have been longer than 24 hours? Well, I don't know. I, I, I don't know how one can answer the question scientifically of, whether, of what speed the Earth rotated at before the flood. <laughs> uh, you know, my own view of the flood is that is probably connected to plate, plate tectonics and, you know, uh, that dynamic by which, you know, if there was a Pangea, if all the land was together in one place, it separated in a, what I, you know, a catastrophic sort of way, uh, not over millions of years. Uh, but, I've lost my train of thought now. Uh, so, do you think, like, like, oh, maybe it was what we were today. Oh, yeah, I certainly, yeah. So I don't know how all of that movement would have affected the Earth's rotation. 
but I had no reason to think that it was significantly different before the flood than afterward. There's no biblical reason to think that. And uh, there's certainly, uh, I think you, somebody along the way said, you know, uh, a day is defined by the rotation time over the earth on its axis. Uh, that's true, that's make it more scientific way. Uh, I tend to, when I teach, I tend to say, Genesis 1 5, in, in Hebrew, presents us with a definition. It defines what a yom is as a period of daylight and a period of darkness founded by an evening and a morning. You know, and when I translate it, I actually tra I don't use first day. When I translate it, I translate it, there was evening and morning, colon, a day, or one day, to highlight that point. So I understand that evening, morning, sunlight, darkness, you know, to be what I mean by a natural day. So I, I think the scripture is very specific in defining what a day, what a yom, what a day is. It's a period of time consisting of a period of light, darkness, evening, morning. Uh, and I have no reason to think, I, I sort of jokingly said, you know, uh, it's what it was for Moses in, you know, uh, 1400 BC. So, uh, but I have no reason to think that it was different than it is now. And I have no reason to think that it was different before the flood than after. Anybody on the panel want to interact with Dr. Adams on that before I move on to the question? Dr. Helmkamp, <laughs> uh, please explain what a quote, just so story, is. <laughs> okay, just so story is where you explain a phenomenon without having any anything to back it up in the way of observation or even some kind of laboratory experiment. So you have a, the principle of, uh, if, if, if the principle happens to be neo-Darwinism, then you have to have a you know, mutation and you have to have natural selection. So you see, like I did with the blind cavefish, you see it has no eyes, and so you just sort of throw those ideas around and explain that that's why that fish population has no eyes. And so that's a just so story. I would love to throw out my definition of creation science while I'm at it. Please. I, I think science, some, some things are subject to the scientific method and you can apply that sort of engine and, and produce results. And other things are unprovable because it's forensic science. And so you're, you're trying to discern what happened in the past from the present and there are many possible models that can describe that, suspect A, B, C, D, whatever. So. I would call creation science any question where you, where the Bible gives you a framework so that you know what models you have to throw out because they're untrue. Uh, so primarily affecting uh, forensic science, origin science, and that would be creation science. That's a, it's a statement that creation doctrine, the scriptures, are are uh, a screening for models that can possibly be true versus not. I think that's the the right way to do science in those fields as a Christian, because you have placed yourself beneath God's word as what is true. So that would be my definition. Uh, okay, now that you're on a roll, I'm gonna put you on the spot. You, uh, you mentioned the troubles with selecting textbooks that are either secular or that are from other Christian bodies. Um, you, you know that, that the Denver Society of Creation has used speakers that are not always Lutherans, and quite usefully, and I think helpfully at, at different times. Uh, knowing that you sit next to a Marine who's also not a Lutheran, <laughs> uh, who's helped with you in the past, can you, could, could you extend words of caution perhaps to the Denver Society of Creation, or what words potentially would you, uh, using the resources that we've been using? I told you. I was going to put you on the spot. <laughs> Do you want to use a phone for I guess. Well, <laughs> I guess the caution 
would be that it was a very real and I felt like the most legitimate objection of the various ones I encountered. That this is a concern um, to use materials that uh, uh, don't have Lutheran theology embedded in them, uh, as well as you know the apologetics for creation. So. I guess the caution would be that it's not a minor question. That, uh, well, like I said, what, what, what the teacher's background has a lot to do with it. So you'll have someone who's really into stuff and really good at it, so they can create their own curriculum and do a great job and find the stuff. But then another person that their background might be their interest is in, I don't know, botany or something. <laughs> or, I don't know, I can't come up with a literature Love someone who loves literature, but they have to teach science. You know, so they, how can you help them? You give them resources to help them, good textbooks. But then, if they don't have the theological background either, then you're you're, you're caught in a position of that's uncomfortable. Yeah. Um, Dr. Heck, you've had to work through some of this too, or do some thinking on this matter as well, even in your own society of creation. Can you offer any insight? Yeah, I, I wouldn't throw my middle under the bus. Uh, but, um, Neither would I. Yeah, that's true. Um, we've had some people from all the denominations that come in and speak at our annual conference. They know who they are, they know who they, we are. Uh, they understand it's a Lutheran organization, they're speaking at a Lutheran university, and we've I don't think we've ever had any problems where they offer something that we would consider heretical. So if they understand the context, we trust them, they trust us, there, there's a bit of a track record. You can, for a lot of these people, you can check out some of their DVDs and see how, how they present their material. You'll probably know within the first 10 minutes whether you want to write them or not. Mr. I, I consider it an honor to be here. I've spoken to many different denominations, and one of the things I like to do before I get there is I'm not there to be an offense. You know, there's little differences, but I'm going to talk to somebody in the church and make sure I don't say something that's going to be offensive or go against what you do. And there's certain questions I just will not answer. If anybody asks me about eschatology, I'm not going to answer that question. Because I don't know what, sometimes I don't know what's taught in the church, but I, when I was coming here, I made sure there's certain subjects if I, I don't want to address, or I'll speak around them, because again, uh, we, we may have some differences. I'm not here to be an offense. So that's the way I look at it. I'm here to talk about a subject, and we agree on the subject, and that's it. I appreciate that. Uh, we, from time to time, uh, have guest speakers in classes and guest professors at the seminary who are Lutheran. I know they do Fort Wayne as well uh, for conferences, and we in our graduate school we have a course like major figures in Old Testament and major figures in New Testament. We will find a visiting scholar in it. But most of them are Lutheran. What we always do is we have a we have a faculty one of our faculty members there technically team teaching the course. Their job is to take care of the theology, but the other thing. Yeah, th this maybe applies more to the seminary than to elementary school. You know, pastors have to learn to how to nego negotiate the fact that uh, sometimes people know good and useful and proper and true things without being Lutheran. <laughs> 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 uh, and, uh, you know, in, in a case like, I mean, when I do this, you know, I say to the guess who's coming in. You're free to state your view, even if it disagrees with ours. We'll, we'll talk about it. You know, we'll talk about it respectfully. Students have, part of the education process, especially at the college or seminary levels, students have to learn how to, you know, how to negotiate these issues and learn how to parse the material that's before them. So, from my perspective, it's okay and in a way healthy and necessary 
for people of a secondary level you know, to, to be engaged in this kind of discussion. So, you know, we don't have a lot of, I don't want to give the impression we have people just kind of all over the place, we don't have that many, but we're generally not worried about it either because we can have these discussions and we know how to handle the theology side respectfully. So if we have somebody who disagrees with us on, say, eschatology, that's, you know, that's fine. It, it's useful for our students to hear their view, uh, maybe. And, and, you know, if I want to address their view, let's say where we disagree, that, that's a useful learning exercise for everybody. Uh, to give you a specific, uh, we invited Robert Bainey to our symposium. He's a, a prominent ELCA theologian to give a paper on the uh, kind of collapse of Christian thinking in even ELCA universities. And he did a good job at, at introducing the topic, but then in a side said, and you know, I, I, I assume you don't uh, take a literal view of Genesis, and here are about 500 pastors. <laughs> So, so I actually got it. I said, uh, you know, Dr. Benny, I just want you to know your audience. How many believe in a, a literal interpretation of Genesis? All the answer. <laughs> That's a true, a true story. I remember a psychological study years ago that I read that showed that students who never get exposed to alternative points of view, and when they leave our schools and they go elsewhere and they come across those, they're much, much more easily swayed than students who are at least ta taught a little bit about or are exposed to some alternative points of view, had a chance to think through that, understand how our theology might look at the same thing and, and become a little more grounded in our theology over against some other you know, particular position. So our, our students are stronger by hearing alternative points of view as long as those don't um, dominate the, uh, the conversation. Thank you, okay. well, I guess my caution was that you might encounter objections more than I was cautioning against. Uh, I would wholeheartedly say use Christian publishers uh, get over secular ones. You know, I'd rather you know see unteaching points of theology than unteaching an entire worldview. And then you, you, you do address those subjects, but you address them you know, from the angle of what is true, rather than, you know, here's this textbook saying the opposite thing is true. So I'm, I'm certainly not for, you know, uh, sh that level of sheltering. I think if you look at the list of books we had our daughters read in their high school years, you would see, you know, no evidence of sheltering. But the, 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 the objection is out there that, uh, for textbooks particularly, that if they're not Lutheran, they are seen as a poorer choice than secular. So that was where I... Yeah, we've been thinking. criticized for some of the people we've had on our campus. And some of them may be rightly so. Uh, there are some that I've objected to myself, to be honest. Uh, but uh, we had one just this last year, and I, I thought the criticisms were not properly founded in that case. But nevertheless, uh, could the criticism be real, and you have to you think about how you're going to negotiate it. Question from uh, Carter. Uh, and this is for all, what might you suggest to those teaching confirmations that will help them continue in their faith? I suppose as it relates to our conversation here, uh, this is addressed to all. Uh, President Forky, would you like to field that one or defer? Well, this is a silver hand. Here we go. So I definitely think that um, those teaching confirmands probably need to expand a little bit um, from what they're going to find in the catechism. So they, they need to recognize, they need to be sensitive to uh, the only that we live in right now. What's been, what we've been talking about here. And so um, I would encourage, you know, some, some exploration of other curriculum, other opportunities to address that issue. And particularly, I would just say, teach Genesis. You know, teach what the Word of God says. So, but to avoid the issue um, is very, very dangerous. Perhaps another, another caution would be 
although pastors can certainly read a lot of the kind of books that we have here. Pastors are not scientists, and I know I'm guilty of this myself. I, I enjoy that sort of stuff, and so I pretended I was a scientist, <laughs> which can get you into some trouble, of course. But uh, teach Genesis, and I think you'll all be okay. Other prior to going back to the parish and teach confirmation, I'd probably develop a several hour unit on dinosaurs. Kids love dinosaurs, and more and more it seems like dinosaur finds are turning out to be strong uh, trump cards in the hand of creationists because of all the soft tissue that's been discovered in virtually every dinosaur find that's been analyzed for this purpose. So there are DVDs out there from various. Uh, creation organizations that can be purchased and do some DVD for teaching, do some wrap that in with some teaching from the early chapters of Genesis and then um, have a discussion with the students about the implications both for the flood, dinosaurs on the flood, why that would be um, possible to take juveniles and, and also some discussion about the, the reason why dinosaurs are the death knell for the millions and billions of years for the age of the earth. Let me, uh, let me add one more thing, and that is, um, as I mentioned in, in my presentation, do not separate Jesus from creation, because I think that happens too often, uh, that we end up just teaching Genesis without making the connection in the beginning. In the beginning was the word. I think that's extremely important. Otherwise, it's sort of like a standalone unit on science, and they're, they're unable to, you know, Seventh, eighth grader, fifth, and sixth graders unable to draw the line from Genesis to Jesus. We get just a minute or two, but Mr. Red. Yeah, you know, one of the I do things called fireside chats where I'll go into a home, invite the neighbors over, or for youth. One of the things our teachers need to be able to do is they want to be able to answer questions from the students. So they need to know what kind of questions are our students getting out there from their peers and other places they have been. And both of those are absolutely excellent. How do you get dinosaurs in the Bible? Who did Cain marry? How can the first three days be days without the sun? How could Adam name all the animals in one day? What about carbon 14, which I can teach to a sixth grader and they can understand it? You don't have to get real scientific. But we need to arm our teachers with those basic questions to confirm the students' uh, ability to trust God's word in its entirety. Because that's where the breakdown is coming. They're getting these questions and they lose confidence. So if we can get the teachers equipped to answer questions like that, then they're going to be a lot more comfortable in their position and the students will be better armed. I think that's all we have time for. I, I'd like just kind of as a whole to, to thank you all and have us uh, give a round of applause to our panelists. <laughs> to uh, give the mic back to Judy, but before I do that, I, do, I want to recognize, I'm, I'm on the board, and I've done very little work to prepare for this conference, but who has done a lot of work as board members in general, and a lot of the members here at Ascension Lutheran Church, uh, and in particular, Jim, and in particular, Judy Finnessy, who just done a uh, significant <laughs> Uh, synodical convention is uh, 
And it's, it's a critical issue. It's, it's tied to evolution. You can't have evolution without having an older. And it's also, of course, the, the biggest issue is the death before sin issue. So it's become a critical issue. And uh, we are so fortunate that on the 2nd of June, uh, we're going to have some leading scientists, creation scientists from around the country in the area. The Creation Research Society is holding their board meeting here. And so we've chosen four of those scientists to speak at our conference at Peace Lutheran Church on June 2nd. And they're each going to be talking about their field and how, and their research, and how it um, agrees with the biblical age of the earth. And so we have from the Institute of Creation Research, we have Dr. Tim Clary, who's a geologist, uh, who has been using the sediments that he finds in oil wells to map the progression of the flood over the, over the earth, and it's, and it's really interesting. Uh, Dr. Daniel Faulkner, who's an astronomer, will be here from Answers in Genesis. Uh, from the Creation Research Society, if you've been at our meetings before, we've had Dr. Kevin Anderson, who's been researching the dinosaur soft tissue. Uh, he'll be with us. And Dr. Robert Carter from Creation Ministries International. And he's been doing research into genetics and how we can use genetics to prove that we came from one man and three women. He can't get, get back farther than, um, than Noah and his three daughter-in-laws, but we can get back that far and to prove that um, we all actually came from one man and three women, and then, of course, the assumption from there is that we came from one woman and one man, and therefore, there's one race. So if you can, I urge you to come and listen to these guys. Uh, the price is $15 for the conference. It's from 1 to 6 on uh, June 2nd at Peace Lutheran Church. So we'd love to have you there if you can come. Um, so again, I want to say thank you, and let's go praise the Lord.